guys, how are you doing? This is Craig here from uh, Bass Lessons Melbourne and today I'm joined by Drew Dedden. Drew, how's it going? Very well mate. Yeah, Very it's well. good Thank to having me. Yeah, good to come round and see you in your natural environment. Yes, this is my uh, cubby house <laughs> slash workplace at yeah. Eastgate Music. Yeah. yeah, nice. I like what you've done in the place. Yeah, it's coming on. It's coming on very nicely. Yeah, yeah. how long have you been working here? Uh, about a year. About a year? Yeah, about a year. Um, it's good. Meet lots of people. Yeah? Mm. Keeps me, uh, gets me out of the house. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe you just want to tell us a little bit about how, how you came to be a bass player. I've um, been playing for about 27 years. Uh, started playing in around Melbourne in rock bands, about 92, I was 17 years old. Okay. I did, um, got expelled from music school from Blackburn High. In, uh, the did you ask why? Term. Uh, yeah, no. Okay. <laughs> nah, I was a bad kid. Um, turned to a bad adult. No, but then, uh, yeah, did that. Uh, been in a rock band ever since. Just, and that's pretty much all I've done my whole life. Yeah. Um, so, but how did you come to the, to the bass? I mean, why not guitar oh, or drums or? Oh, so I went to um, one of the first early concerts I went to was I saw the Ramones at Festival Hall. And supporting the Ramones, the Ramones are amazing. Yeah. But supporting the Ramones was the hard ons. And Ray is breathing fire and playing this bass that's strung down at his knees. And yeah. here's me, this kid going, I'm doing that with my life. It seems to happen to a lot of people that go to a concert, a gig and see it's like a, you know, life changing experience. Yeah, oh yeah, definitely. That was. Uh, that was so, such an influence on me. Like that was all I. That was like I was set. Like as soon I came home from that thing, I went right. I'm getting a guitar. I didn't even realize there was a difference between a bass and a guitar at the time. I just wanted that long guitar. <laughs> Had to be black. <laughs> and my birthday was like a couple of weeks later. I went to Music Junction with my mum and I bought this killer black Torch Vintage Series P bass, and it was epic. And it was the best thing ever. A couple of big fat plectrums. Had got my little. I think it was a little jade ten watt practice amp. Turned it all the way up, <laughs> and then was and learned power chords. And I would have been playing for maybe two months like that, just like trying to work out, you know, ordinary creator riffs and Metallica, just really yeah. awful, awful teenage, angst, early nineties horrid music, and then. Um, and you're doing you're playing most of that with power chords, or you? Oh no, I, I was just playing it like this. That's it, and and I actually it's funny because I, I you know we weren't super knowledgeable about music. Yeah. Um, you know we grew up on hip hop and Beastie Boys and all like that. So, and then we our, our circle of friends, our, our sort of um, entry into punk and hardcore and metal and everything. We we just figured out oh, well, we just we figured out what power chords were. Yeah. We figured out if we're playing together as long as we, like the Black Sabbath rule. As long as you play on the dots, it's all going to be pretty much in key. <laughs> And we knew like you could do that, and then we could do this, and we listened to it, started listening to lots of Iron Maiden, and we figured out, oh, we can play every Iron Maiden song, you know, so forth. So um, that went for that. That went for a couple of months, and then a friend of mine who was much more knowledgeable on musical instruments said, um, "Dude, I have to break this to you, but <laughs> that's not a guitar. It's a bass guitar. Said, what the hell's a bass guitar?" <laughs> and he put on. Um, we listened to the Beatles come together. Yep. And then I listened there and that was the first time I heard bass and I went, like, actually went, I had no idea, absolutely no really? idea. And I went, okay, cool. All right, I'm signing up for bass lessons. Started getting lessons off uh, Phil Bromeo at one, in Montana for a term. He uh, went straight there. I could, well, technically I could just play it, so that wasn't a problem. Once I figured out bass technique, I got a Lewis Johnson uh, video and the Jarko video and I just sat there and just, how I learnt it. Yeah. Got a real book, went, oh, cool, this is cool, learnt walking lines. Um, and then, so um, you were just like absorbing, you were just like bass. Yeah, yeah, that, that was in February, that was February like 91. I think I had my first pro gig playing in the orchestra in August, September. Yeah. They said, oh, can you sight read? And I went, yeah, yeah, I can sight read. <laughs> and no, oh, no worries. And you know, I could, play, I could slap because I could do this Lewis Johnson video note for note. So we were, oh, it's a great bass player, but I could just do that. And can you sight read? Yeah, I can sight read. And I was going in there. To ask a friend, what's sight reading? They're like, man, it's you'll find out. <laughs> you know, so I get this thing, it was a uh, score for uh, My Fair Lady, and it was the orchestral score. It's got this double bass part yeah, in there. Right. I was looking at it going, 
oh shit, like this is bad. And I'm like looking at it going, okay, I've got to learn to read music. This is before the internet. There was no, nothing. Yeah, so yeah. I had to go to the library. I got some music theory books and I went, okay. And I got a tab pad, actually I photocopied some blank tab pad. And then I sat there and I put in tablature the entire My Fair Lady <laughs> score. That's amazing. And I got paid my first pro gig. I was getting paid like 150 bucks a night for the thing, for the school production. There was the guys all in the band were all like, hey, hey, it's Saturday yeah. band. And I'm there on this kid and I can play. And I just, I wag school and I just played and played until I could eventually just memorize the whole thing and I could just play it. Um, and then, yeah, I got a scholarship at the end of that year, went to like the got into, I was a hopeless student, but I got into Blackburn because my music sort of could play. Mm. And then, yeah, I got kicked out and joined a rock band. That was it. That was the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> so there was this curve. It was like from, I guess, at the end of 1990 to the start of 92. I just did up to there. And yeah. Then, yeah. And then from then on. So you were like 15, 16, 17 kind of thing? Yeah. I would have been, well, I mean, it's 15 when I started, yeah. So. yeah. And then, um, yeah, basically just from there was, uh, we were in the old school, you know, we were listening to heaps of shrapnel record stuff like Jason Becker. Doing Yeah, all that. And it was just <clears throat> like home, out of school and just practicing, you know, 12 hours a day. Yeah. That was life. Um, used to play a lot with Reuben Morgan who went on to Hillsong fame. Right. As one of the composers. And back then, before he was, you know, gone to... I knew the old old Ruben that was <laughs> hardcore dude was smoking darts and drinking and just playing guitar like that's what we did. We just lived yeah. in lived in Warrandyte and we were just long haired bad kids that just played all day. And um, yeah. So you put in you put in all the work back then, really? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I well, I figured uh, it was just a weird time for me in my life, and it was just sort of coming out that my parents are just separated and everything, so I was almost a chaotic kid. Yeah. And it was all I sort of had in front of me, you know? It was like we were mm. wild kids partying every night, but it was get up in the morning and just practice, you know? I, I got kicked out of that school with them, sort of saying, well, you know, you're, you're never going to make it anywhere in the music industry with that attitude. And I was like, well, fuck you guys, you know? And I literally took the, the, all the whole music course of the year and just went home and studied it and just studied everything I could find, go to the library, jet down, hitchhike down to, down to Alpha, get as mm. many music books as I could carry and bring it back and just read them and study it and yeah, I just figured that's what I'll do. Yeah. Music? Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah, it just made, um, yeah, and I was just convinced I just wanted to be this, you know, sick oh. bass player. Just, <laughs> I thought back, but it was a different time, it was before or grunge had sort of kicked in, but there was still this uh, sort of higher state of, you know, legendary guitar players around at that time. And that was like, it was a no brainer. If you put in the hours, to me at that age, you, you put in the hours and you play, you'll be successful. Yeah. You know, and, and then sort of the music industry changed as it did. And then, you know, it was sort of went from there, well, went into some playing in more sort of harder metal bands and stuff like that. But there was yeah. no, Probably, there was no nothing. It was like Dream Theater was this thing that was happening on the other side of the planet and, and it was impossible. Yeah. And Rush was this thing that <laughs> happened in the past that was impossible. And so there's somewhere in between that, you know, we've formed. What about like Racer X or that kind of stuff? Are you checking that out? Oh, yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 yeah I've, got, I've got a beautiful song in the Racer X album, actually. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, it's, I love that. Um, yeah, uh, the, all, all that whole era of shred metal is like my go to music. I, I love it. Yeah. Yeah. Bit of Ingvi, Rising Force. Yeah, I love Ingvi. Go love Ingvi. Go, I, I, I just love that stuff. I, I, to me, it was like, <clears throat> I don't know, a lot of people are like, oh, it's cheesy, it's whatever. It's, it's rad. It's sick. It's seeing guys like playing their instruments at like samurai level of skill, you know? <laughs> yeah. It's not soulful. You don't go to a Malmsteen gig to go, oh, this is, this is, mm. you go to Malmsteen gig, fuck. <laughs> just like we went to Dragon Force a few months ago man it was incredible I just yeah. like yeah dude that's the shit you it know. sounds like everyone's just been sped up by like 50% yeah <laughs> if I had my way with the solo project I'm doing it would be all shred but there's no one's going to listen to that so I'm, I'm kind of toned it down and I'm yeah, sort of writing with you maybe a little bit more mature in the, it is a little bit more mature yeah definitely it's got it's got its moments of um, chaos there but I'm, I've limited that down so I want about the fourth rewrite at the moment nine tracks completely demoed and um, first single will be out hopefully November. So is this, in terms of like this material, is it like something you've had 
and you know sitting around for years and years or did you kind of sit down and go I want to do now I want to do like a solo bass album thing mm. it started actually it started with a project of a good friend of mine who passed away and we started back in 2012 and it was a uh, improvised electronic band called 23. We only did one gig. It was, it was quite fun. There's a video on YouTube of it. It's just this wild improv electro stuff. And um, and then it sort of stemmed from there. I had these songs and then I moved to Korea for a while and, and sort of got my life together and kept writing. Um, and the, the sort of process of this thing has gone on and on. I didn't sort of go, oh, I'm going to do a solo album. I went, I've got all this music I've got to get out of, out of my system. And I've done a heap of solo demo stuff for all the way since 2000 and it's just it's loose it's really rough raw solo based stuff all demos is you mm-hmm. know 23 odd f- full complete demos there's hundreds of tracks and it was kind of that was my outpouring doing when I was in super heist it was like you know it was this new metal thing and we're very, very much living the rock star thing for about four or five years and there was no not a lot of time for music in that so away from that while that was going on it was a lot of writing a lot of demoing and doing stuff it was very immature music. It was just me just venting pain and anguish through mm. guitar, you know. And then sort of gone on. I'm, I'm very patient with this. I didn't. I, I haven't wanted to rush in anything with Made in Melbourne just because I'm trying to find I'm trying to write something that actually really means something to me, and I don't want to waste a single note on it, you know. That's the, that's that's sort of the philosophy of it. So um, yeah, to be I'm, honest, yeah. And, and I'm just crafting it. So, yeah, just working with good people um, who are just into it and we're working off scores and everything, you know, so sort of... So is it, like, just multi-track bass or is there... What else is going on? No, there? so there's two bass. So there's myself, Eric Stock, um, playing six-string. And it's not, it's not so much he plays the bass parts and I play the lead parts. There's a whole mishmash of things going on on there. So the wood w- bits where we swap, there's a lot of... Because we've got that high C string too, a lot of the harmonic chords we can do together, we can, we've been experimenting with capos and all sorts of old yeah. tunings to, to build these beautiful thick chords across the two instruments. Um, and did you kind of record those parts together, like live together, or kind of multi-layer? No, I, I just keep stacking on top of this Pro Tools demo. Yeah. yeah so just keep putting bits in and I'm sending him, sending him sheets and he's going, what is this? And he's like, oh, dude, come on, man. Stop it! <laughs> <laughs> he's great. He's a killer player. Like he's uh, Eric was a student of mine about um, well, wow, fifteen years ago probably, and he was always very good. He's a trained bit music teacher. He's good, killer player. Um, amazing chops, and it's really good to sort of have. He's a, sort of the rock of our, our little thing we've got going together. Voice of reason, almost. Yeah, and he's yeah. And he doesn't care, he'll tell me if something's shit or whatever or that yeah. and whatever. And, yeah, so we work well together. We have a lot of mutual respect for each other as sort of friends and players. So. And um, my partner, Hiju, she writes a mountain of the music um, together. She writes a lot of the heads. She's an insanely talented um, piano player. And um, she's, yeah, really good. She's really honest, too. She'll sit there and go, no, nah, nah. nah. I'll be like, oh, this is sick, James. Nah. God damn it! So there's a whole there's a whole process there. It's good. The people there kind of like helping you to be the best that you can be. Like it's like a team of producers almost. Yeah. So it's, it's sort of the, the the thing is that the whole album is a soundtrack to my musical life in growing up in Melbourne. You know, yeah. way at school and going watching um, Lindsay Buckland play the dulcimer in Burke Street Mall to everything I've done in my life. So it's all sort of these. It's just that whole journey of everything. You know? Yeah. It's, the, it's actually quite nice. You put the demos on and just cruise around in the city tram and you're like, yeah, this, this is it. This is the, that is the soundtrack for this city. So, yeah. Does it get heavy? Yeah, it's got a little bit. Let me just die. Oh, let me. Come back to me. Again. Let me. No. no. <laughs> oh, let me. Um, it, it does. It gets heavy in parts. Um, it's got a lot of dynamic. I, I didn't want to... Because so obviously that's, I mean, that's your, your roots is like, you know, that's kind of your... Yeah, everyone knows me as this heavy, yeah. heavy player because I guess in a band uh, band context, there's mainly the stuff I do is, I've played is metal and rock. Played in a funk band for a long time in the 90s, played in Bakehouse for years. Okay. Um, and yeah, I play a lot of minor jazz and that sort of nonsense 
like all the just double bass, just walking lines and stuff like that. But that 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 there is a that's the job. That's the painting houses of bass playing. But this sure. is the. I'm getting a lot. Poetry. I'm getting a lot of poetry. <laughs> no. Yeah, well, it is sort of kind of, it is, it's, I don't, I'm sort of trying yeah. to think of it as like, it's something, it's kind of bearing your soul and, and yeah. doing what you think. It's it's very much not bass playing. It's played on the bass, but it's, it's music. music. Yeah. The actual bass playing, the, the job of being a bass player is what I do. And I mean, I'm constantly whoring out for cover bands and all sorts of things. So, yeah. yeah. I do a lot of, you know, a lot of, a lot of fill-ins and a lot of, a lot of bits for people. Then I guess so. Reconnect is you. I bet for you, out yeah. in Bayswater or something. <laughs> Your car didn't get broken into. No. Lucky. No. I mean, if oh, Bayes is yeah. is pretty rough. No, it's, yeah. I I I will look if it if it's paying money and there's free beer <laughs> and a palmer, I will do it. I don't care who it's to. Where is it? It's, but people get very precious about. Um, what they do and everything like that. It's like, man, get, you get a gig offered to you. You know, if you're getting a bit of coins, beers, what, and you're getting out there, you're, you're basically getting paid to go and practice and hone your craft. You know, you get dudes that look really bored on stage. I could play the, have the worst, most hideous gig and there's no one there and you're playing some backwater horror at RSL in the middle of nowhere. And I'll just be playing there and I'll be practicing, man. I'll be playing the songs and I'll be sitting there practicing and I'll be working on my technique and I'll be thinking about how I'm fretting things. And we're going to the zone and go, this is great. I've got to sit here, I've got a great loud amp. And never waste a single moment when you've got that instrument on you. You know, the minute you get to a gig and go, oh, I can't be fucked. Well, well, fucking go get a hobby, do something that you enjoy doing. That even the worst gigs and the worst moments are still awesome. And it, you know, and even and, and on that note, when you see when you go and watch a band, you know, you can learn something from every single musician you see, even if they're the shittest, even if they're terrible, then analyze why are they terrible? Make sure you never do that. <laughs> Don't sit there and say, oh, this is fucked. Mm. Really analyze it, look at it. Why are you hating it? Is it the sound, is it the pitch? Is it what are they doing wrong there? And, and constantly, I can never relax when I go see a band or, or if I'm playing a gig because I'm constantly thinking about this. If I'm in the pocket and I'm playing, then I'll start really thinking about the drummer and thinking about everything the drummer's doing, mm-hmm. where, they're, they're, where their foot's going. And, and you're constantly this inner producer of everything you do. You just let it go. And as a player, it makes you expand the whole time, you know? You, you, you're, never, you're never the master of it. You're always, you're always a student of music. Yeah. You can, I figured this with bass, and I said this to students in the past. You can... You know, they go, oh, you've got great chops and you're fluent, this is so good. I was like, I'm a student. Because basically, I get to the end of it. Once I can play everything here, then, man, I just get a left-handed bass and I'm going to start from scratch. <laughs> and, and I do that, actually. I have a left-handed bass and I do practice left-handed. That is, a, that is, a, that is quite good. That's, that's a good one to do. About an hour, you know, an hour a week on left-handed bass. <laughs> yeah. Just one, I know. Yeah. yeah, it's good for you. It, gets, it was interesting when I, when I started doing it about two years ago. I went, oh, cool. And I got the left-handed bass off a friend. He like, sold me a bunch of stuff. And I went, oh, cool. I strung up. And I went, actually. And I got out my, like, beginner, like, progressive <laughs> bass book and went, I'm learning this thing from scratch. This is fucking wicked. And, man, it was seriously just pick, starting from scratch. Was, Did it like, when you, you Do you know, reckon it's improved your right-handed play? Uh, yeah, especially. I, th- I think it's important that every couple of years you completely relearn your technique. Because you can always do things better, more economically, mm. yeah. And there's not a, there's not enough of that. Like, and, and to avoid the pitfalls of getting like caught in a rut uh, with your playing, just like whether you're not inspired to play or or, or whether you you're struggling with something. I think it's very important to go over and analyze what you're doing. You know, take some foot, just jam in front of the camera and look at it and go, man, what am I? Forget what I'm doing good here. You know, everyone can do shit good. Everyone has moments of good. Fine, that's a given. That's what we're trying to achieve. Just focus on what you're doing badly mm. and then figure that out, you know? And that's, if you, yeah, if you keep in that headspace um, with, with, with the bass, you, yeah, it just constantly, it, it's always refreshing, you know? Who, who would you say has been kind of uh, pivotal with your technique development, bass-wise? Um, Definitely your song, Billy Sheen, and... Uh, yeah, I, I would say... 
everything. I, I just love bass players. So I mean, the, my, my I've got my favourites and stuff that I love playing. I love I love the Who, I love Ant Whistle, Doug Wimbish, Killer, uh, Getty Lee, Billy Sheen, of course, um, Stu Ham, amazing. Okay. Um, just oh, uh, lately, um, um, Richard Boner. Wow. Yeah. Wow. I bought that amp. Purely, okay, so I'm sussing out my new rig and I, I'm going, oh, what mark base do I get? And I had a loan of one. I'm going, oh, yeah, this is cool. And I had a look and come up the Richard Boner improvising at mark base headquarters came up and yeah. I just went, oh, yeah, I'm buying that amp. That amp, that box, that's it, done. <laughs> I so want that. <laughs> yeah, that music comes out of that. I want that thing. So, and, and this is killer. Like, this is probably my, I've had lots of bass rigs in my life, but this would be my favourite one. Yeah. 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 With the... Uh, you know, you're doing your own solo album at home and stuff like that, but you've also been in some pretty big studios as yes. well. Yeah. What's well, your, do you, do you like the studio process? Like being, yeah, yeah. being in there and tracking and stuff? Um, yeah, last, September last year I was in uh, NRG in North Hollywood. We did the um, Super High Coast and Social Dead album and we got to work with Jay Von Gardner um, as producer and Kyle Hoffman as an engineer. Kyle was killer, like, you know, he's, work with some amazing bands, Earth, Wind and Fire, and you know, like just these things, you know. You know, the week, the week after I was there, Nathan East was in there recording in that studio, and, uh, and Lemmy, Lemmy had his own chair in that studio, you know, there's this, there's a whole, it was an unbelievable place. Coming from someone that had played new metal for so many years, it was like going to new metal Disneyland, you know. <laughs> Lincoln Park Hybrid Theory was recorded there. Yeah, yeah. So the piano, we, when we run our track, the piano for Ghosts, that was the piano that in the end was recorded. I was in there having my Lincoln Park fanboy moment going, this is <laughs> fucking cool. Uh, we did 11 or 12 days there. Um, did you learn anything new? No. Um, like in terms of recording process, your approach to, in terms of being in that situation? Oh, I've worked as, I've worked as an editor um, in studios for Pro Tools. I'm a, a drum editor and, and vocal compa. Oh, okay. That's what I do in The Secret Dark. That's my... Right. Other, other persona that I do. So yeah, I edit albums. Okay. Um, I got into it early thousands, um, doing some fix-ups for stuff that was coming in out of Metropolis, South Melbourne, and sort of got onto it from there and became the one of the sort of go-to drum editors for a while for the Melbourne metal scene. Mm. I've cut millions of kick drums. <laughs> <laughs> millions, millions, but editing in that. But in, in, as far as the recording process goes now, when I... When I track in the studio, I will grab a bunch of beers, I'll turn the monitors up really loud, stand in front of the desk, and I will play like I'm on stage. Okay, yeah. And that's the best way to record all the time. If you sit there and go like, you know, if, it depends what you're playing. If you're playing solos and playing hard stuff, then shit, sit there and, and play it mid and get that feeling. If you're playing rock or metal and that, just crank it, do it. You've got to have, capture that, fuck, aggression, bang, you know? It, it, otherwise it doesn't sound right on the recording. Yeah. Yeah. And um, generally you'll be, you know, overdubbing, not all playing live at the same time. No, no, no. So you just track. We actually did, uh, usually the bass goes after the drums. I did the bass after the guitars because we were using a lot of, uh, some like, it was only down tuned to A, but a lot of that super high rhythm stuff mm-hmm. was just, it's a lot of very clanky low A stuff. And there's a lot of really subtle, like, quarter bends and things like that we did. So I just... We went back after um, to to match exactly what they were doing. Kind yeah, of. yeah. So we get that the right sound there. Yeah. I mean, it was pretty. The bass I was recording in the middle of the night, sort of most most of the time. I track maybe did maybe four sessions and just did sort of through the night till sort of midnight to two o'clock. So everyone was tired and buggered and you know drunk from the day. And <laughs> we drank over a thousand beers while we were there <laughs> between five of us. <laughs> it was wild. And, you know, Hollywood summer and it was it was. Good going, man. Good day. What, yeah. Do you know what your signal tune was? Uh, I was using, I forget that, I was using a lot of the gear that, um, all their in, in-house stuff. Used a Wayne Jones preamp for some stuff. Um, Did you use this? No, I actually tracked on uh, Jay's old vintage uh, five-string music, man. Okay. Yeah. Um, but this great guitar tech there, uh, Stig, he's a really famous Hollywood guitar tech used to work for Steve Vai and Billy Sheen and everyone back in the day and he was in the studio with us the whole time. You know, we had a bunch of gear. Um, ESP gave me one of those um, 
We tried one of the Bunny Brunel bases, we couldn't get the tone. I took my TRV, still couldn't get the tone. So we pretty much ran basically a five string music man um, with all of the, this is an interesting thing that I learned in the studio for according metal. Turn the entire EQ, everything up to full. So you have, it's so hot coming out of here. And I thought, oh, that's a bit weird. And it's basically what like Dark Glass are emulating with that pedal now, that sort of raw tone. That was, well, basically when I first heard that alpha pedal, I went, oh, that's the tone we're trying to get in the studio there. Right. So it just peaked out, um, Music Man. Uh, yeah, just naturally distorting. Chunk. Yeah, and I, I play quite hard in the studio. Um, and then, yeah, and then, yeah, they just did it through that and compressed the shit out of it. And, and then <laughs> it, that's the sound that came out. And it actually sounds really, uh, I think it was the, probably the best metal tone that we've got on an album. It should be too. It's cost a freaking fortune yeah, to, to do that, yeah. So well, t- tell us a little bit about the surprise journey, because that was like a kind of re- reunion thing, or, I mean... Yeah, well, it was a well, well, band in, in short, we, I got the band in 99, um, then the band sort of went busters with eight miles high a couple of months after I joined. And it was pretty much on until the end of 2003. It was um, full time, that's all we did. Yeah. So that was it, we toured. Did you, were you feeling like you finally, this is it? This yeah. is your ticket? Yeah, well, we had to, we had in our hands a huge record deal in 2001. And unfortunately, September 11 happened right after we got back the first time after doing the deal. The negotiations went off the table because American music industry went into sort of, cha- it was just chaotic timing, it was terrible. Mm-hmm. Then came back, that was after Project Crew came out. And then we came back and then uh, we we lost Berger as a singer, we got Joey in as a singer, and then no one gets a second chance, we got a second chance, we went back to LA. By that stage, we were burnt out, we'd been, been going solid for three years. Um, well, and, by the time we got to Hollywood the second time, we still got you know got a decent deal offered to us on the table, but the band was ready to implode. Mm-hmm. And I think we, by the end of 2002, the band went for about maybe two, three months. We got back together for Krusty's. 2003, it all started again, and then eventually the um, band self-destructed at the end of that year. And then I think, uh, yeah, me and Richie decided in, we'd been talking about getting back together for a long time. And then, yeah, it was decided around the time of the Iron Maiden gig in Melbourne, it's like, let's fucking do this, you know, let's do this properly. We'd had a few goes at it, jamming and everything like that, and um, poor Lemmy, it's over. <laughs> oh, it's all symbolic. But um, look, for me, that was, um, you know, as I, you know, we, we did the album, we did a killer, nearly sold, completely sold out tour of Australia. Um, you know, the Melbourne show was huge, Sydney was huge, and, um, and it was really good. It's kind of this thing where you you go back and you, it's unfinished business because the band was such a big thing and part of my life mm. and it ended so bad. You kind of, and you, you know, in my forties now, and I kind of went back and did these awesome gigs, met all the people, all the fans of the band, hanging out, had beers, had a great time. After that was over, things got weird politically with the band again. And then it was, it was a very easy decision to walk away from it again in January. You felt like you kind of finally closed. I got, yeah, I, it was weird timing. There was weird shit going on and I had closure and I had sort of different opportunities come to my life and I, I went, yeah, I can't, I can't, yeah, it wasn't. When you're in your 20s, you have a, a bit better tolerance for bullshit, I think. Then when you get a bit older, you're kind of like, mm, yeah, but man, mm. it's, it's about the music for me, you know, I'm not a, I'm not a lifestyle musician. Sure. Yeah. So what, what do you reckon would be your dream gig? Mm. Oh, they're all good, man. It yeah, doesn't matter. Let's go back to that whole thing. Dream gig? Actually, dream gig, man, and you hope he's watching this, Marty Friedman, that's who I want to play with. Marty Friedman's bass player. Yeah, really? Yeah, man, that would be, um, yeah, well, yeah. That's, that's in the cacophony of these. Yeah, all well, the new stuff, man. His, his latest album, and Inferno is probably one of the greatest albums guitar albums ever done. Right. Um, playing with someone of that caliber, like a guitarist that is just frightening, would be, I would love that. I would love to be able to, you know, play, but every gig's a dream gig, man. That sort of goes back to whether you're playing, I want to play some really big shows, 
in my life, like huge, huge, you know, big day out shows and main stage and all that. Yeah. And they're as good as those, like I said, those the gigs to nobody. Mm. It's all about this, this little area right here. You know, that's always, that's a constant. For, you know, concentrate on making that good and hopefully it'll translate to yeah. the rest of the band. And yeah. fun, right? The dream gig is just being able to play for people. You yeah. Know? That's, it doesn't matter whether you're, success I think is um, a very overrated thing. The journey of coming up with an idea and getting together with someone going, hey, we should start this band, this is a vibe. That right there is the best, exactly the best when people are looking at a peak, that's the peak. Everything from that point onwards is a bonus. <laughs> but that first spark of inspiration, it, it truly is because it doesn't, uh, yeah, it, that, that initial, oh, we could, oh, this is working. Looking over at a drum, like, yeah, dude. Or looking over, yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's it. That is as good as music gets. Like all the rest of the stuff, like fame, being famous, signing autographs, doing whatever, that's just, it's good because, wow, it's kind of like a bit of, you know, success. People love what you do. I mean, cool, appreciate that. But that ain't this. Mm. This is the important bit. And it always, it always has been to me. Like, um, just, yeah. Playing bass, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. Yeah. If you ever, you know, see me playing a dead, dead backwater cover gig, I'm having as much fun as I am if I'm playing a big show. So that's yeah. cool. Yeah, that's a good spirit to have. Yeah, man. It's I think it's the only way. And as a, I've noticed over time, many bass players um, generally think like that, as opposed to a lot of other musicians don't think like that. Bass players tend to be like. Bass, you know, get together, we talk about a gear, and this is what we do. We, we, we're basically nerds of music, you know. <laughs> <laughs> That's what we are. Embrace it. That's right. Yeah. But, um, I think it's really important to never lose sight of, you know. Why you started playing in the first place almost? Yeah, because it's fucking awesome. <laughs> it's just the best. <laughs> it's wicked. You're here, you, got, you, know, you know what's going on, you know, you're, you, you, that's it. Yeah. Yeah, that, you can't. Um, and you, you know, getting into the scene mid to late 90s like that's kind of like the beginning of the music industry revolution mm. you know in terms of you know the record companies and stuff and I mean talking about getting a record deal nowadays is is almost a mute point it's yeah, like, yeah yeah you know it's all DIY guerrilla stuff band camp and starting your labels and stuff like that so you kind of experienced it really in that in that shifting period you know if it had been like that forever no one would have complained about it. Uh, the, mm. the pros and cons of the way the music industry has changed. The best bit is it's a level playing field. The bad bit is there's way too much white noise when you're looking at that level playing field. Yeah. There is a million better people doing better things than what you're doing right now. Seek them out and either collaborate with them or... Support them. Support them or get better than them. You know, use that as your thing. There's, especially in metal and rock, there is like every combination of everything ever available right now. You can Google it. You can just go, you can spend the rest of your days every just purely watching time. prog metal yeah. and you'll never see it all. You know, yeah. it's getting produced faster and, and they're amazing bands. And um, we, we, we've hit this, the, the bad thing about the music industry is that we've sort of latched onto this... Um, uh, retro thing where things are retro to us. No one wants to see, people want to go see Kiss, but no one wants to hear their new album. Yeah. You know? No, no, no one wants to go hear the Who's new shit. People want to go and experience the, that classic uh, album. And it's moved on from being to an entertainment industry where it's like, like the Rolling Stones have had this theory nailed for years. The Rolling Stones haven't, you know what I mean? They've just been chucked on that same thing forever. That's why they're a huge touring band. Um, Metallica is another band you know there was an interesting article do Metallica need to produce new albums I like the new album I'm a Metallica fan but do they really need to no they could probably just go out and play tracks off the first five albums and the gigs will be huge but and, and somehow we've don't we've, think as Lars probably can play it as well as you hear on the probably not <laughs> great drummer though I love him I love Lars love to hate yeah he's the, he's the first Real awful rock star I saw on a video just going, wow, dude, like, man, you're rugged. Like, <laughs> I, I kind of respect that and just go, wow, like, that's, that's nuts behavior for a grown-up. I love yeah. it. But, um, 
yeah, I actually watched some kind of monster the other day. I get all teary when they offer Robert a million dollars. They kind of go, oh, dude. He was my um. Yeah, that was me. Infectious Screws, man, that was, that was my, that was just like the best, coolest shit ever. I cut that front off the bass player magazine, had it on my wall of him playing. That was, yeah, love that shit. Then, got, then he got Metallica, and then he got, I'm like, dude, he's like, what? Yeah. That's the perfect guy from Metallica. Um, I mean, no, back on the industry thing, look, the important thing is, I think, with the music industry is, um, it, and as long as no one lose sight on this, is if everyone just gets up, and focuses on what they can do for everybody else and not themselves, they'll have success. That's a no-brainer. Meaning? Support your scene, your bands, and support everyone else. Don't expect anything. Don't feel like the music industry owes you or you're deserved of something because you put this much time. Don't worry about any of that. Just worry about what your friends are doing and support their things, share their videos, Promote their thing. And then the cycle, everything you give out to that universe, just come and give it back to you, straight back to you. And it's, that's, the music industry has become that chaotic. That is probably the only thing that will bring order to it. There's no climbing the mountain and putting, getting a record deal and putting out back-to-back platinum albums anymore. It's not going to ever happen ever again. You know? You're not going to get that golden ticket. No, but is it a golden ticket what, where you're recouping yeah, exactly. hundreds of thousands of yeah, dollars and, and, and getting bugger all royalties? People are complaining about Spotify royalties. It's like, well, these people ain't having to pay for their album. At least they're not trying to recoup something. Yeah. I mean, super high sold a shitload of albums. Do you think we ever got any money for it? Nah. Not a cent. We never recouped. Yeah. So That's what you get for a flying early to record for 10 days. Oh, well, that one. Yeah, that one. The original one. <laughs> when, when we did Price Recruit, we did four weeks at Sing Sing okay. in Melbourne and I was like, Eighteen hundred two hundred two grand a day, like it was just insane, you know. And that was we had to sell a lot of albums to get that back, and yeah, we we did sell a lot of albums. A giant bank loan, the record company. Yeah, basically, it's like this. An old school record deal works like, hey guys, I'm a uh, I'm a I'm a, I want to build a house together. We're going to build a house. Now you guys are going to build the house for me, and I'm. I'm going to supply the materials, but you've got to pay for all those materials the house is getting built out of. When we sell the house, we're going to give you a tiny little sliver of the profit. Mm. When the house is paid off, we'll give you a little bit more. And that's how a record company old school works. Like that. Yeah. There's nothing there. Unless you're someone huge and you, you guarantee to sell a shitload of albums and you're laughing. You just can recoup it. But for a band, you know, the yeah. Well, let me ask you this: What's your what's going to be your um, approach or plan of attack for me to Melbourne? Like, how what how do you see getting that to the right people? Great. I think I think uh, you know online and uh, it's all about the you know, videos and great songs are great videos. You know, and people don't want to just listen to a song anymore. They want to experience the video. They want you've got to have the video, yeah. You've got to have the video. If you don't do the video, there's no point. And you've got to do a good video. It can't be a shit video. If it's a shit video, you might as well have not done any of it. Yeah. Um, but my, my whole plan of attack with this is I've got a Hidden Root and a video coming out for that later in the year. Um, then I'll get to the next one. Okay. Yeah. There's no, I've got no timeline on it, whatever. People are sort of, oh, you need to get a release date. It's like, mm, don't really. Like, not really. Nobody's, nobody's, the record company's not waiting for it. We're talking about bass instrumental music here. This is like niche inside a niche. Not even bass players like this shit, right? This is like, here's the music industry. There's bass players. Here's bass solo records. <laughs> and it's a sliver inside the tiniest sliver. I yeah. love it. You love it. it we we yeah. love it because we're bass nerds. But that's exactly. we like that sort of thing. A lot yeah. of people do. Majority of people can. No. <laughs> it's like, so when when did the vocals start? Exactly right. <laughs> no, no and it's not written, it's not written for any. It's not like there's no contrived reason for any of it yeah. other than just yeah. This is the music that's in my head. I'm just yeah, trying to record it. Right. I, yeah, I hope people like it. If they don't, then phase me I, yeah. I, I like it <laughs> and hey yeah. if, if it was good enough for like you know Mozart and Haydn it's good enough for us you know exactly yeah. right. <laughs> just do it and, and enjoy it and <clears throat> I've got no um, be great punch out uh, you know put out a couple of shows and have a lot of fun with it and mm. see if I can pull off half those mental solos live and I'll be there watching yeah 
Yeah. Like, no, <laughs> damn it. Now give me the tab. And he just... <laughs> the tab. <laughs> it's actually hectic when the last we've done, or, you know, sort of only two performances of it. And then before we did the guitar show one, I was just like, sitting out, it's like, man, we're having a smoke going. What the fuck are we doing this to ourselves for? <laughs> this is just hard, man. We're playing Horizons going, I'm playing this all, just going, man, I'm watching the video back on there. Thank God I got that. I got that. Yeah, right. Juggling patch changes and playing those leads and getting the pitch shifter to not make ugly sounds. There's so much going on in that. What comes yeah. back to the yeah. space, the zone. I don't even know what's going on. Yeah, once the music's finished, then cool, I can sit back and go, oh, thank God, that's over. <laughs> it's, a real, it's, it's extremely stressful playing a lot of those, those parts because they, they, are, they are extremely difficult. Yeah, because um, at home you get the luxury of like, you know, 20 passes and just, that's it, punch it in, that's yeah. it, got it. Yeah. And then you've got to string it all together. Oh, dude, I'm a sick bass player. When I'm sitting in front of my Pro Tools at home and I've got my monitors on and oh, I'm yeah. all good and I'm a cup of coffee there and I can, I can absolutely play anything. As soon as you take yourself out of that environment, do you, do you find that? I find that, that, you know, and I think a lot of people do, is that in the rehearsal room, you're like, cool, sorted, I can play this. And then you get on stage and it's just like, why are my fingers sausages? You yeah. know, like they're just like lead. Yeah. You know, do you, do you find that, that you, you kind of work at like 70% of your ability on stage? Uh, for regular bass playing, it doesn't matter. I could play drum tied up in a bag. It doesn't matter. <laughs> if I know the songs, I'm good. It doesn't matter what is actually happening. Okay. I can figure that when I'm soloing and like expressing and trying to yeah. playing melodies, it's a, I'm a completely manic yeah. headspace for it. Because it's, um, you know, we, the bass is nice. We can hide, we can sit in with kick drums, we can, we can hit a bit of a yeah. bung note. In, with guitars with laden with effects, they're great to solo on because you can just yeah, you can and play, the note will work. You can play less. You play a bung note on a bass solo, man, it's, it's rough, man. It's yeah. just, don't, it just, it's rough. And, um, but I think it's just that preparation and being able to quickly step into that zone. Generally, once the music starts, I have no recollection of what's going on until the song stops. Okay. Yeah, I'm just completely know. like I, I've gone to another place, yeah. It's, it's always been the same way with me. Um, obviously, you got Ding Wall mm. with you. What was your first, oh, you told me what your first piece was. What's been your progression in terms of? My, you know, we don't. We're not going to make a whole separate video on your. No, no, no. I'll do it really. <laughs> uh, bunch of cheap and nasties. Got a hone headless. Love that thing. And then um, I think my 80th birthday actually in two days' time. It turns 25 years old. My Billy Sheen attitude base, okay. which I've had. This picture of Billy Sheen on the wall. Picture of Billy Sheen on the wall. Sign. Yeah, that's is it like that? Is it? No, no. It's the. It looks like that with a J. It's the cheap and nasty attitude limited from back in the day. It was not cheap and nasty back in ninety two. Yeah. It was very expensive. But, yeah, uh, had it forever. <coughs> it's been yeah. Take it to one of the two. No, no, it wasn't that fancy. Oh, no, right. no, no. It was only the cheapest one I could afford on right. on next to no money at the time. Yeah, and I uh, put the Marzios in it and hip shotted it up and brass nutted it and yeah, it's had multiple wiring upgrades and everything like that. And I've played the hell out of that thing. Um, that was my go-to base for everything other than Super Heist. Then I used, uh, I was the, you know, the posters and stuff for Yamaha back in the day for TRBs. So I had heaps of those TRB five strings and six strings and stuff and wicked basses. Um, <coughs> always had Yamaha right up until I got a Fender a couple of years ago, I swapped that out and then uh, fell in love with this exact Dingwall two guitar shows ago. It was the demo one that Bass Center had. Mm. It was the last one they had left and then they had it for sale and I, within 30 seconds of them listening on Facebook, I was on the phone to them saying, hold it, I'm getting it, it's time. What is it? Why, why, what is it about it that just that this finally solved things for you? Sheldon Dingwall is, He's a genius, man. He's created a bass that a lot of people are a bit fearful of the fan fret. This is like the new technology. This is like going from the cell phone to the iPhone for me for, get, for bass playing. It's the things I love about the most, it's the even string tension on the B. So Bs are generally flappy, E's are flappy. This, yeah. The way this is designed is that you can put as much smoothness there as playing the same string tension everywhere. You've got this ergonomic thing where you can just 
your distance of moving when you're playing chords. The only thing is getting used to the turning your hand more. Yeah, but do you? What about you want to do that? That may, you know that minor seven kind of open. Like if we're doing like that kind of minor seven chord. Okay, yeah. They're a bit weird up there, but you don't really think about it. You can flip it out. So speed round up. Basically, when you're doing runs and playing quick up here, you instead of feeling like you're going up and trapping yourself in that little horn thing there, yep. you're going, you're running away from it. It kind of comes closer to you almost. Yeah, and then when you're doing sweeping sort of things, it just fits, just feels better. And then down here you've got these like big fat frets you can really dig into, you know. It's funny when I get on a normal bass and I'm like, oh, it's so little, it's so tiny. <laughs> so it takes, takes a lot of boxes for your technique and your musical style, I guess. Yeah. And it suits me because I have a funny technique I use on my right hand. I play a lot of harmonics and I bend a lot and pinch things and... Yeah, the pinch um, harmonic thing is really... Yeah, I do lots of it, yeah. Yeah, it's really sweet though. Especially with the, doing it on the chords, that's nice. Yeah, yeah, you get, you get like a... So you're getting that, like getting the node with your thumb and then plucking with the yeah. finger so behind sort of, it. Just do the math on it and you go, like, that's the obvious 12 one, but then that fifth fret's going to repeat. So therefore you got your, yeah, you, you, you got your major chord. Yeah. Right, you got that here. So you can go. One chord shape, you've got all these tones. Yeah, nice. Essentially, if you tune your bass to a, well, figure it out with harmonics, if you tune to a certain key, then all your harmonics put it in tune, right? So you've got your, your major triads here. The bass is almost in um, the key of G, right, now. So you can think G, C, D, meaning the roots of my major modes, right? Got my D. So if I take my A, and move it to G, C, or D. So say I take my A, two, six, oh, two, six. Take my A up to a C. So yeah. you just change your A string to a C? Yep. Put my low B up to a C. Drop my E down to a D. I've just put my bass in the key of G. All my harmonics are now in tune, right? So you get some root notes going. Interesting, an alternate tune is it comes from a old uh, uh, column that Michael Mantering was doing in Bass Player magazine back in the late nineties, and he was talking about all these crazy alternate tunes, and you do all these things with um, hip shot to tunes. Yeah, yeah. It's basically applying that thing. You can do the same thing with capos, and you can capo off your fourth fret, and then you can make there's a couple of really good keys that will do it. But you can sort of jam a capo on two strings like that, yeah. and then all of a sudden it gives you a whole harmonic field up here, mm. which gives you a whole lot of new shapes you can bridge into as well. It's, it's interesting interesting stuff, um, getting into all this whole science of harmonics. Yeah. There's a lot of people are like, oh, they're just time-like noises, but it actually, it's a no-brainer. They're just, it's just, a, you've got a, if you think of it as you've got a major with a kind of slightly out of key flat seven on every string that you can utilize, which is that, that, that's it, and that, then, you know, that'll repeat no matter where you fret off. So if you're capering off, then you've got that repeating sure. in here. Yeah. 
it's interesting when you, you, you want to get into this. I've got a few uh, little columns and stuff on my Facebook page you'll see there is how to play you know, a, any tune in harmonics. And there's a video where I do the tubular bells and stuff like that. You can play anything in harmonics. You just sit down and work out the, just the yeah, science right. of it. Work out where you've got a D tune to. Or, Pistorius did it there when, you know, you can't do it on this place, it's too big. <laughs> but Portrait of Tracy, you know, he frets the second fret and bang, he's hitting that sixth fret one up there. Yeah. First time you get that music out, you're like, how the fuck does he do that? On a fretless. What? Yeah. That's yeah. brave. But, um, yeah. The harmonics are beautiful. They're, it's just a different sound, you know. I've always done them, I think, even back in rock stuff, you know what I mean? I, I was in the Iron Maiden and I love the way Steve Harris always hit the, the fifth chords, you know? Um, yeah, it's, but it's too much. The guitarist let the minute you do. Fuck's sake. So it's um, coming. So it's, it's a different, um, yeah, it just comes from more necessity of like, more, more me! <laughs> do you find that uh, having a little bit of a little bit of drive, a little bit of grit on your tone, did, did, you, did you ever play with that live? Like a bit of, you know, the Billy Sheen Ampeg grind on there? I usually just turn the mids right up on my amp. Okay. Yeah, I just turn it. I do use pedals now, so I use, sure. the multi, I use three different drive pedals, um, but also I just turn the mids up on my amp. Okay. When I'm playing, like if I'm playing a gig, like doing covers gig and that, and I just want a bit more sound, yep. that's the another you know your EQ thing's really important. Like, sure, get a great bass sound all you want, but then the only thing that matters is listen to the guitar and then deduct or add enough mid to bite through it. You know that classic Spectrum Boss pedal, the original one. That, that's just the spike, and you just that's it. That's that thing is the difference between. Everyone's going to feel what you're playing because you have a big subby sound. But if you actually want definition on your note, finding that little spike, you know, yeah, um, finding that, getting that thing so it just works right. You know, point your amp at the furthest distant point of the room and then find that mid spike, that, whether you need to come up or down. So you can just, uh, it, it, that's I think I could be wrong. I'm not, I'm just, not the science behind it, but that to me is where you can create heaps of weight with your bass sound. You know highs and highs and lows, but that that mid thing is the mm. bit that's going to make the bass notes actually enter someone's brain clearly. Yeah, you know, it doesn't even have to be loud. It, it just it's just got to be there. So yeah, and you find that this rig that you've got just now is yeah good for that. Yeah, and you can see here on here, like even my setting here, that's the mid lows nearly all the way crank mid highs. Yeah, you know there. Yeah, then I use these. I just sort of change these most around for the room. Crackly. Bit dodgy. <laughs> Chick gear. We'll edit that out. Chick. Daddy L. I love this. But that, you can kind of, if you put up on that real. Is you know, unhappy face and happy face? You know, you want that with your. Yeah, so you want it. You're playing in a metal band, there's two guitars and shit. It's unhappy. Oh, happy face all the way. Yeah. Because you don't need to be in there. It means there's a real guitar, you're going to ruin someone's. It depends if you like the rhythm guitar or something. <laughs> <laughs> I don't really rate that guy. He doesn't really like that amp in. It's like, but if, you, if you're playing a single, um, uh, single guitar, then you want the unhappy face. So you've got that thing. You don't need heaps of sub there. There's a, if the drummer's kick drum sounds really good, mm. don't fuck it up. Mm. Let that have its space. You know, nothing worse than when the bass player's got too much sub in there and then the drums start losing their definition. You might as well, if you ruin the drum sound, you might as well have not gone to the gig because <laughs> whether you like it or not, to the audience, that bass and drums is the same thing, you know what I mean? Yeah. Regardless, but that mid-tone, like you can hear here, it's got a real growl to it. It burps away and it's got that real... Yeah. And what? What, what's going on here? Oh, it's, it's, it's all chaotic. <laughs> like, here? Uh, I'm never very good at these things. Actually, I saw that 
Richard Bonas Federa thing, and he's got all these guts taken out of his base. Yeah. I'm, I'm actually going to do the same thing to this. Really? Yeah, yeah. I'm just going to get the volume all left on all the way. Do you have like a setting that you just have it on all the time? Yeah, I check that these are in the middle. <laughs> <laughs> This, but, then, but there's like a switching... Yeah, thing. there's a switching thing. Um, yep. I should know, but I, I don't know. Like pick up selector or parallel series kind of thing. That, yeah, that, that's passive, active. Right. This is a four-way selector. I know that this is super nasally, <laughs> slightly nasally. That's really good for slap, and that's my rock tone. <laughs> right, finger tone. I want a P bass. I want a slap. Right? Uh interesting harmonic type solos and then the back one if I'm on really project put the reverb on that's that's how it and then just the EQ is just flat leave it, leave it flat and then this is like if uh, like the other night the you know bass thing my, if my sounds are oh shit I've, oh shit I'll start tailoring that is the in case of a, a total totally emergency break glass. <laughs> that's my, oh man, I really should have checked those amp settings, put a bit more time, and then that, I, I, I just use that to fix that until I've got time to fix that, and yeah. then that goes back to the second. Yeah, emergency, yeah. tone control, whatever, yeah, yeah. in the middle or something. Yeah, yeah, if it's not, or, you know, it's colliding or something, or I'm too subby, I can just take it out there. Sure. Yeah, so that's, Oh, probably not the right way to use gear, but it works for me. And I've done that with every bass I've ever had. That's sort of the default thing. It was an active bass, and that, yeah, then that EQ's the bucket. <laughs> <laughs> should should, and, um, should sound check that better. My workplace. This is a pretty cool little space. Yeah, this is, um, we're at Eastgate Music, and you can find me here Tuesday to Saturday, holding up the counter and hanging out here. Um, yeah, we've got some cool stuff here. Yeah, what, what are you guys kind of doing? You getting anything like exclusive or we do mean? Look at these guys, which is, off the dingle is my next favorite bass on the planet. Once again, I know I sell these things for a living. There's a whole lot of EQ settings here. You just find a sweet spot with it. Uh, it's an EQ, uh, there's a switcher to go between here. And there's a whole lot of things to turn and pick up off that's in here. The piezo thing? Yeah. I think it's probably a personal taste, I just crank them forward. It's really quick, this bass, you know, it's got a nice tone. Should be, they're not cheap. Ned Steinberger nailed up in this one, though. It's just a nice. What? What is it? It's a NS Design CR5, it's called. Okay. So they have a couple of, they have a CR4 and a CR5. These are like the, the high-end uh, NS Design bases. They yep. also have a WAV base, which is about half the cost. So these ones are made in Europe and uh, the WAV ones, I think, are made in Indonesia. Okay. The, the WAV ones are, we don't have one. No, we don't have one at the moment. Um, they just have a single pickup in it. It's similar to like my dingle compared to a real dingle. Not to say my dingle's not a real dingle, yeah, but yeah. it's not a real dingle. Yeah. You know what I mean? A real dingle is, you know, is the base for rich men, as we all know. Uh, but um, the, the, these are fantastic. These are killer. Um, weighty. Um, Bill quality is nice. It's sick. Like, <laughs> look at that bad boy. Yeah. Very ergonomic. Um, yeah, I've, I really like the old um, cricket bat bases. Eric actually has got a cool five shot. Uh, like the Horner? The, the old, the old, the old Steinbergers, yeah. yeah. I'm a big fan of them. I really like them. They, they, they've always look like they look like balls, but man, they play well. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah they're, they're ugly as hell, but no, they they play really, really well. And uh, these are they, these are kind of a probably one of the first really good looking headless guitars that's come out because usually they've got a bit of a stigma attached to the headless guitars. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Helps. In the old days, it helped if you were like there. <laughs> um, Did you ever get into the Kubikis? Yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. Did you have one? No, I wish. Yeah. I keep that one at base and it hanging above the counter though. Isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Like, uh, that's the classic line, you know, the Stuhemel. <laughs> that, that whole um, uh, Kings of Sleep album. Oh, we're, we don't. What were we saying? Oh, talking about Kabiki. Kabiki. Kabikis. Um, yeah, that was the 
that was, you know, grow up early 90s kid, that was the base man, you know. Stu Ham, um, got to meet Stu Ham a few years ago at his clinic. Oh, Look, a top bloke, um, really nice guy. Asked me if he still had that acid wash vest that he was wearing on the front of baseball <laughs> magazine. <laughs> Love it. I've got, he signed it for me. It's great. But, um, it's, it's, but, but that's, that sums up 90s bass playing for me and yeah. Stu Ham right. on, that, on that bass. And then he had that. And then he had, oh, he, had the good, he had a good mullet going there for a while. Because this uh, shake does a little bit. That's a shake the neck through, yeah. Have a, crank it down again. A little bit of a. Keep it keep it yeah. Oh boy, you got to lift up and twist. Wait, yeah, there you go. This is quite busy. That's a really nice space. Schechter, Schechter aren't known to be as a base company. That is truly a beautiful neck through that, and really good build quality. Yeah, it's hot. It's super hot. Too many cups of coffee. Um, you were doing one of your weird harmonic tunings on this, weren't you? Possi quite possibly. <laughs> oh no, a lot of gen kids come in and did tune these things, man. Yeah. That's the guy. Plays really well. Yeah. yeah. I think it's, a, it's kind of their take on a. It's a music man-y kind of warwick-y, neck through -y. and then the look of it's got, I don't know, I like it. It's I, a bit 90s. Yeah, I like it a lot. Yeah. It's a, I think it's a stiletto, a diamond stiletto, like they call it. Stage, Stage 4? Stage 4? Shake it to it. Yeah. Stage 4, yeah. It's a killer. Yeah. Killer makes it. There's a five string one floating with them too. Yeah. But, no, it's the Yamaha TLEX. Oh, yeah, they are Whoa. similar. <laughs> Look at that. There you go. There Qu you go. Just a coincidence. Just a coincidence, eh? Mm, where are do you want to see something really? Oh, no, I won't do it actually. <laughs> <laughs> I will do it. Uh, yeah, cool, man. So, um, TBXs, oh, the, yeah, there's a beautiful old J bass up there. It's like the grand, great grandfather sits in the room. New broad bases, new yummies, fenders. Cool. Bring yeah. some some different stuff, some interesting things. Yeah, bases. Some yeah. good amps and stuff. Yeah, mostly yeah. we've got. Um, that's pretty sexy. This. Oh yeah, some nice Aguilar here. So that's a Aguilar, you know, white hot Aguilar. They're good. I like these new colours. There's a twin one there as well. And some pretty sexy yeah. and stuff. Aguilar pearls are pretty killer. A Trace Elliot, ring in some Trace Elliot stuff. Yeah, the new elves. New elves. Extremely loud fuckers, that's what that <laughs> is. That's actually what that stands for. No. Yeah, man. Are they, do they crank? They do crank, yeah, they are very good. I can't wait to get the cabs in a month or so. Or, yeah. And I've got a little new, I'm a bit of a Trace Elliot fanboy over there. Big, Again, name his base. Yeah. Oh, I got lessons off Wayne Jones, man. <laughs> so as a 17 year old kid getting driven to bass lessons down at you know, Wayne's house in Mount Waverley and going to his studio in his backyard, and he's literally got a city of Trace Elliott <laughs> sitting in the studio. I'm like going, I'm like, I was going home in my little jade. And yeah. I walk in there and there's just this Trace Elliott's like this, like a, like a, literally like a city of Trace Elliott's <laughs> sitting in front of bass the, green, the green wall. Yeah, man. Um, Wayne Jones was a huge influence on me on the early days. I yeah. love the love him as like a you know he's the father figure of my bass playing. So cool. Yeah, and he's uh, it's good to see him play the other week. He's a rad, as always. Yeah. And, um, yeah, no, he's yeah, it's very cool. I can't believe that bass he's got. It's just excessively outrageous. That oh, the Dera, Dera. my God. Yeah. What a machine that is. Yeah. Yeah. What a killer bass. There's probably one, there's some nice basses there. The other, other Eric's six string is pretty gourmet too, that custom shot Warwick. But mm. that, uh, yeah, that bass of Wayne's is good. But I'm, all, I'm always here in the shop to just talk bass and nonsense and any good advice. Any, I just like bass players hanging out. That's what this is all about, man. Yeah, man. Awesome. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Very good. Yeah. Good day, man, everybody. Good day. Thanks, man. Cheers, man. <laughs>